you when you're outside, but we'll do what we can today. <laughs> so I'm just going to share my screen and put on my slideshow. Okay, so everyone can see my first slide, title page slide. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, my name is Erin McLeod. I work at True North Forestry Consulting here in town as a technician, and I have a bachelor's of science in biology. I'm a biologist in training and a forester in training, so um, I really like nature and being outside. And so Tree ID kind of started when I got a career in forestry and an interest in the outdoors. So yeah, this is a bit of a, a hobby of mine, so I'm happy to share. So my presentation is going to go over um, coniferous trees versus deciduous trees and what those mean and the differences. Um, some key ID features of the trees around the cusp. And then we'll talk about specific conifers, deciduous species. And then I've got some suggested resources for people that are interested in um, ID re resources. And um, like Claire said, if you could mute yourself while we're presenting, um, I don't mind if you interrupt me if I'm making things confusing. You can unmute yourself and let me know, but um, otherwise we'll keep it muted so that we don't have any interruptions. And yeah, the presentation's recorded, like Claire said. So coniferous trees are also known as evergreen trees because they retain their leaves through the winter. Um, so they don't, they don't go golden or red and they don't drop them when we get our snow. Um, we have one genus that does lose them, but I'll talk about that later. Um, their leaves are usually needles or scale-like, so they're not like a nice leaf like you'd find on a maple tree or something. They're pointy or um, really heavy and scaly, and they reproduce using cones, not fruits or flowers or something like that. Whereas deciduous trees are also known as broadleaf trees because they have broad, wide leaves um, that can vary in shape depending on the species. Um, most lose their leaves in the fall, so they, they're the ones that change color and fall off in the fall, and then they don't have leaves over the winter. We don't have any that keep their leaves in our area, but on the coast there's um, a species called Arbutus, and they keep their leaves on throughout the winter, even if they get snow on the coast, they keep their leaves. Um, and they reproduce using flowers and fruits, all deciduous do. So they get little catkins and flowers rather than cones like coniferous. So some key ID features that you can use to determine what tree you're looking at. Um, you can, it's easiest to go by the bark because usually you're standing in a, a forest where all you see is tree trunks. You can't always see the needles. So if you can get good at picking out what a tree is from its bark, that's um, the best way to go. Um, if a tree has needles or scales or does it have broad leaves, that's a good determining factor of at least where to look in your ID book, whether you're looking at a conifer or a deciduous. Um, and how are the leaves arranged on the branches or the stems? Like, do they go all the way around the stem? Are they really flat? Um, the leaf shape and the placement are really good ID points. Um, and where is it growing? So is it at a certain elevation? Like some species you only see when you're up high in the alpine. Um, is it a certain habitat type? Like, is it a really wet spot? Is it in a creek? And then microsites are really important for trees as well, or plants in general, because unlike an animal, a plant can't choose where to go to find what it needs. So um, certain sites need to have certain characteristics to grow that plant. So that's a, a good way of determining what you're looking at. It's like certain plants only grow in certain habitat types. Um, a couple other questions that aren't as important, but that can still be helpful are how is it spreading its seeds? So does it have cones or fruits or flowers? And what is the overall shape of the tree? Because some trees have really um, particular shape to them or have little features that sometimes you can pick out. So coniferous species. And um, just to be clear, there's a lot more than this. These are just the dominant ones in our forests and in our area. So. Um, yeah, if you get an ID book or an ID source, definitely make sure you're looking through all of your options and not just going with the first one you see or what I talk about today. These are just going to help you with um, the ones that you'll definitely see in our area. So coniferous trees are the dominant um, tree type in our forest. 
deciduous kind of are sprinkled throughout, but definitely we have more conifers. Um, so we're gonna start with larch. And I've added the Latin name under the common name for all the species because it's a better way if you're looking up trees on Google to it's better to use the Latin name because trees have a lot of common names and you don't want to mix them up and think that you're looking at the right species when in reality someone's called it a different name. So yeah, if you use that name in um, italics there for any searching, that's probably your, your best way to go. So large bark is um, really flaky and has a lot of thin layers that are easy to break off. So you can see in photo number three, the bark has started to kind of separate and you get some fissures and crevasses that can kind of go reddish colored. Um, and then you have the older bark on the outside that's really thin and you can, if you're by the tree trunk, you can take little pieces off of it super easily. So really flaky. Um, and then yeah, it can get a little bit orangey. Um, large shape, it's kind of a scraggly looking tree, like the branches are quite short. Um, the needles are quite short as well. So you can really see the shape of each branch. It's not all bushy like a pine tree or something. And some of the trunks from far away can look orange just because of the coloring of the bark. So large, um, as I mentioned before, are, we, have, we have one genus in our area that um, drops its needles in the, in the fall or winter, and that's larch. So that first photo, number one, shows larch when they're turning golden. That's when the needles are all dying off and they're gonna fall to the ground in the fall. Um, so the needles grow in little clumps on the branch and they're kind of like circular clusters of needles and they're quite short. And um, when they fall off, they grow new needles. I think you can see my mouse. They grow new needles out of the same little bud. They just kind of hide out in there over the winter and then they pop out. Right around now, we're seeing the needles start to pop out on all of our larch in our area, which is super cool because they're always a nice bright green. Um, what else? Their cones, if you can see the cones on the tree, they have egg-shaped cones with um, little tips on the scales. So you can see in picture number four, the cone is really fresh in that picture and it's just coming out of the same little um, bud as the needles are. And it's got those little points on it that kind of look like needles, but they're growing on each scale of the cone. So moving on to cedar, Western red cedar. Um, its bark is probably the easiest to pick out because it doesn't really look like any other bark we have in our area. Um, it's really scaly, or sorry, it's not scaly. It's really, it's in really long strips that are really fibrous. So it's got really vertical lines on the trunk and the bark comes off in long strips when you pull on it. Um, it's usually, um, cedar can grow to a really large diameter, and especially in our area, we have a really lot of, a lot of good cedar microsites. And so, yeah, they get really large. Um, cedar is really, it's really common to see heart rot, which is where they start to rot from the inside because they're so old. So you can see a lot of crevasses in the bases of cedar that are really good for wildlife and, and birds and animals and things. And then they also get these funny little buttresses of the roots. So the trunk of the tree develops these really long um, kind of yeah, a buttress is the only word I can really think of, but kind of like flares in the base when they're really old. And then their shape is not super particular, but they kind of have really long sweeping boughs. And they are the only ones that have these scale-like needles. That's a really quick way to ID a cedar besides the nice fibrous bark. Um, it's got these needles that are really flat and um, they kind of grow in little scales, one, one out of the other, and they kind of just fan out from the stem. And as you can see in photos number two and five, they have really small cones. They're only about a centimeter long, I'd say, and they kind of grow in little clusters at the end of each um, needle branch, and they only have a few little scales on them. So yeah, they're quite petite little cones. Western white pine, it's a, I really like this tree because it has such column, like the stem is just so straight and clear and just 
straight up and down like a column. It's really pretty. Um, and it has really fluffy branches because the needles are so long. So you can see in photo number one, it just looks really fluffy and really soft. <laughs> um, and the bark gets this really scale-like appearance once it's older. Like it's kind of these square scales, kind of like crocodile skin almost, but they're not super deep fissures and it's not bark that you can peel off like you can with cedar or something else. And, um, but that being said, when it's young, the bark on a young tree is really silvery white which is maybe where the name comes from. And it's not, um, it doesn't have any cracks in it at all. It's really smooth. And it often has these blisters on it that are full of pitch. So it'll have like a bubble. And if you poke it, it's just pitch inside. Okay, and um, another thing for the shape on young trees, it's kind of a pine thing in general, but the, the branches kind of come out of the same place along the stem. So they'll have like a cluster of branches that make a circle around the stem and then you go up and there's another circle. So it's kind of like a ladder. That's a good way to ID a small pine. Western white pine's the only one that has um, clusters of needles in five. So the needle clusters are a really good way to figure out what pine you're looking at because um, certain species have a certain number of needles in a cluster. So white pine has five needles per cluster. So if you were to take a branch off the ground or off the tree or whatever, and you just picked out this one little clump, you should be able to count five needles in that. And they're usually pretty long needles, not as long as a ponderosa, if anyone knows what that is. We don't, I didn't put ponderosa in my slideshow because it's not super common here. It's mostly in the Okanagan. Um, we're starting to get it here a little bit, or if you go down south to like folk your Edgewood, that you start to see ponderosa. And it has really, really long needles that are super bushy, but um, white pine, you're definitely gonna see in our area and it looks bushy as well. Um, where was I? Cones. So the cones are really nice, actually. They're nice and long and slender. Um, and I find that they have a lot of pitch on them. Like you can see in photo number three, there's a lot of pitch dripping off of each scale. Um, I wouldn't say that's like a particularly good ID feature, but it's just kind of interesting. So if you see like a really big cone, um, long, slender, quite large with a lot of pitch on it, it's probably from a white pine. It's a good way to see if there's one in the area. So lodgepole pine is another common one. Um, there's a lot of lodgepole in the campground, the downtown campground. So if you ever want to walk down there, you can definitely spot some lodgepole. Um, it's pretty scrubby looking, I find, like it's not as clean in appearance as a white pine. Um, the needles are shorter as well, so it doesn't look quite as bushy. It has dark bark, like it's usually like a dark gray, and it has really small flakes on it, so it looks a bit smooth, and it doesn't really get much cracking. Like in photo four, you can see a few lines, but I think those are just scars, and you can see there's some pitch coming out of them, which is pretty common if a tree has an injury, then it puts out pitch to fix itself. Um, then then um, moving on to the needles, it has needles in clumps of two. So white pine have five, lodgepole have two per clump. And they're also a lot shorter than the white pine needles. Um, and their cones grow off of the stem, or sorry, the branch. And they're much smaller than a white pine cone and they're kind of round and they look really tough. Like every scale is quite thick and they have some prickles on them. And I think that's to protect the cone from um, like squirrels and birds and stuff that want to eat the seeds. So they're, they're pretty tough little cones and pretty short. And then in photo number three, you can see the pollen cones, those little um, kind of round things, that, that's where the pollen comes from. And then the, the cones in photos one and two are the female ones with the seeds in them. Okay, Douglas fir. Douglas fir is super common for us. Um, it's a very like conical but tapered tree, like it's a nice even tree shape most of the time. Um, they can grow really large in diameter as well, and we have a lot of old Douglas fir in our area. The bark on old trees gets really deep fissures in it that can get orangey down the, the center of the fissure. They kind of develop some color. Um, 
they I wouldn't say that they're flaky bark, but you can definitely see that it has layers to it. And it's kind of it kind of gets a corky appear, appearance, like kind of almost looks spongy, but it's still really hard. And they have really thick bark, which is um, interesting because they're very fire resistant. So the bark protects the tree from a fire. And they're also self limbing, which is cool too, as a fire resistance thing. So they, they drop all of their lower branches once they die off. And so that protects them from a fire reaching their crown. Um, Aaron, I've got a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, you're saying that the pines are like ladders because their branches grow out of the same spot. Mm -hmm. So the fir are not like that? Are they sort of staggered in their growth? Yeah. Like so they're like they do come out of a whatever order. Sometimes they're in the same place, but I find that on young pines, it's just more obvious because there's more of a gap between them. So like on a fir tree, they'll be staggered or different spacing between branches around. But on a, a young pine, they're just all out of this spot, and then there's a gap, and then they're all out of this spot, and then there's another obvious gap. So it's just um, more structured, I guess. If that makes sense. I, I just realized too, there's a question here from someone asking if um, if you said that cedar is the only um, evergreen with flat needles. Yeah, they like their needles are more scale like they're not long. Um, they don't look like one piece like the rest of the needles do. Uh, they're they look like a bunch of little segments that are kind of scale like coming out of each other. They're the only one that have a structure like that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, photo number four is a younger trunk of a tree. So you can see that it doesn't have as deep of fissures as photos number two and three of the older bark, but it still has a little bit of red striping in it. Um, and it's just, yeah, just starting to get some cracks in it. And then these are the needles and the cones of the Douglas fir. So you can see that Douglas fir don't have clusters of needles like a pine does. It just has a single needle coming out of the stem. Um, they're quite short needles and they're soft to the touch. So if you grab the branch, it doesn't hurt you like it does with some pines or something maybe, or a spruce tree. And they're, they can be like this nice green color like you see in the photos, or they can be kind of bluish depending on the tree, like a bluish green. They kind of look dusty. Um, and yeah, the needles go all the way around the stem. So they don't, they don't kind of stay on a flat plane. They, they wrap around the stem and they're pretty even all the way around. Photo number one shows the cones. I would say like they're a medium sized cone. And one thing I learned when I was little that has still stuck with me for some reason about Douglas fir cones is that the little bracts that come out from under each scale, those little funny things, the little swoopy bits, they, someone told me that they look like the, the butts of mice. So it kind of looks like a, a mouse tail and mouse feet sticking out from under each scale. And that's just stuck with me ever since. So that's a really quick way to ID a, a Douglas fir cone. And then photo number four shows the pollen cones, those little, um, the small orangey clusters, that's the pollen. And then the red structure is the developing female cone, which is what photo number one is. Of spruce trees, um, there's there's quite a few species of spruce in our area. Um, some you'll only see at high elevations. They're not super common at low elevations, but we do have them. I've combined Engelmann spruce and white spruce into the same slide because they look really similar. We have both of them and they can actually hybridize, which means that they're two separate species, but they can interbreed. So you can get a cross between the two. So I find them hard to ID, so I just thought I would make a, like a common spruce slide. So spruce are pretty slender in their shape, like they don't have very long branches and they only have a slight taper at the top. They're pretty like straight all the way up and then there's just a slight taper to the point. Um, they, the Engelman spruce is in photo number one. You can see that the bark is a, like the flakes on the bark are a bit bigger than the bark in photo number two, which is a, of a white spruce. So in both species, it has really flaky bark. It's usually like a, a purplish gray. 
but Engelmann spruce pieces come off in bigger flakes than pieces of a white spruce. And um, other than that, they don't really have much of a, a shape or anything besides being kind of pretty straight. So they have needles similar to a fir, but they're a lot stiffer and they hurt when you touch them because they're pointy at the end. And yeah, they just have more of a, they're more dense. So you can't, they're not soft to the touch. And they can also be kind of a bluish gray. Some trees are more blue than others. And their needles point more up towards the sky than a Douglas fir does. Like they're kind of concentrated on the tops of the stems, but they still have them wrapping around the bottom as well. Um, Engelmann spruce cones are a little different from white spruce cones. I'm not sure what they look like in the hybrids, but in photo number four, you can see that the scales have, um, they're not quite as smooth as the scales in photo number three. They have like a little dip to them and they're just a little bit more wonky. So photo number four is of an Engelmann spruce cone. So they're the ones that have a little bit of a point on their scale. And then white spruce cones have really smooth scales that um, are nice, a nice round shape and really smooth along the bottom edge. Oops. Okay, Western hemlock, also a very common species in our area. Um, hemlock is one of the ones where you can easily identify it by its shape. So if you can see the top of it or the upper branches or something, you'll definitely see that. The, the leader, which is what we call the, the very tip of the tree, it kind of hooks over like it's nodding its head. So it just has a droopy leader. And then the tips of the branches kind of droop over as well. You can see that in photo number one, it just looks kind of like wilted almost. So all hemlocks have a droopy top like, like that. Um, I would say that the bark isn't particularly fissured. It does have cracks in it, but they're not as deep as a hemlock. Um, and it's, so its overall appearance it is quite smooth. It's usually really gray like this and just kind of flat. You can't pick off any of the bark like you can with a larch or anything. And yeah, that's about that. The needles are very soft and delicate and they kind of grow on a flat plane, unlike a, a fir that has them, their needles all the way around the stem. Hemlock tends to be um, very flat, and then they have a few that try to grow on the top side, but um, for the most part, they're just horizontal like this in photo number one and photo number two. And then, um, Interestingly, they, another thing I remember from when I was little, somebody told me that they have bluish, they have, their needles are blue underneath. So if you take a branch of a hemlock and you flip it over, they, it has this bluish tinge to all the undersides of the needles. And a lot of other needles don't have that, I guess, because um, hemlock needles are just a bit flatter. So they're more, they're not as round in, the, in their shape. They're just like flat. So they have a, a light green top and a bluish underside. And yeah, they're kind of feathery. They're really soft little needles. Um, hemlock cones are really small. They're a bit bigger than a cedar cone and they're a rounder than a cedar cone. So they're just little small round cones that um, are usually in a cluster at the end of the needle branch. Oops. Okay, and then my last con conifer is a yew tree. Um, this one, isn't super common. It's just kind of a cool tree and um, it's actually classified as a shrub in my ID book, but it's it's still something that we see often enough in our area that I figured I should add it because it's kind of cool. So you is um, kind of strange because it doesn't like sunlight. So it just grows under the canopy of other conifers. So in a really dense forest, you'll just find some random you growing all scraggly, like it has really strange growth patterns under the canopy and it doesn't get very tall. Like I wouldn't say that it gets taller than 10 meters most of the time. That's actually a very tall U probably. And it usually has multiple stems. So it will come, it will start at one base and then it has a bunch of stems that are branches that turn into main stems. 
Um, it has very peely bark. And so these big flakes of bark come off and then it, it shows this nice smooth red underside, um, like the new bark underneath the peels, the stuff you peel off is this nice smooth red. And the needles are really flat, similar to a hemlock, but even more flat across the stem. And they're pointier on the ends and waxier, so they kind of have a shine to them. And um, in photo number three, you can see that they have these funny little fleshy seeds. So they don't really develop a cone like conifers, like or the rest of the conifers do. They get these um, little red berries almost. But definitely don't eat them. They are poisonous. And I doubt they taste good anyways. So yeah, that's the last of my conifers. And then deciduous the species. Um, I only have a few because there's only a few major ones in our area. Um, but if you get a plant book or um, find a good ID page, there's definitely a lot more species. Um, most of them, other than the three I'm going to talk about, just stay quite short and have more of a shrubby appearance. But they're still good to know because we still have other species in our area. So starting with paper birch, this is a pretty easy one, I would say, because it has very obvious bark. Um, it's like paper. So in photo number three, you can see that there's these big sheets of bark peeling off and they're really easy to take off and they usually start to fall off by themselves. Um, they're usually pretty white, the bark, but it can be gray. Um, sometimes it's a little bit red, especially on younger trees. Like in photo number one, you can see it has a bit of a reddish tinge. And the bark usually has these um, horizontal lines in it. Um, those little white lines. And then it also gets some black lines in older trees, also horizontal lines. Um, the overall tree shape, it usually has multiple branches that turn into leaders almost. So it has multiple tops, like in that little silhouette in the bottom left corner of my screen. You can see that there's, it has this really dome-like um, shape to it because there's so many branches that are pointing upwards. Um, I added the, I added photo number six to just remind you that in our area, we don't get straight birch forests like they do on the east coast of Canada. So if you see birch, they're usually mixed into a coniferous stand like you see in photo number six. There's just a few stems sprinkled throughout the coniferous forest. Um, and their leaves, they're, they're broad leaves, so they lose their leaves in the fall. Um, when they're green and new, they're a nice light green. Um, they're kind of, I would say, like a moderate size, and they're kind of teardrop shaped. So they have a really obvious point on the end of them, and they're kind of have a round bottom side near their stem, and they, they have a really jagged edge. And um, yeah, they have a nice even vein pattern to them. And photo number two is of the catkin, which is what you call like a, the flower structure that develops into seeds. So birch have catkins. Trembling aspen is one that you might mix up with birch. Um, it also has very white bark, but unlike birch, it does not peel at all. It's a really, really solid bark that um, it, it's, even almost more white than birch, I would say, just because it's so much cleaner. It does get some black scarring on it. And one thing that I think is cool is that um, if a bear climbs an aspen, it, it leaves these obvious claw marks in it and they automatically turn into these really dark scars. So like there's trees at the ski hill in town that you can tell a bear climbed at some point because there's these black scars in them from the claws. So that's kind of cool. Um, and they, I would say, don't grow very tall here. Um, but they definitely are mixed throughout our forest. And I think there's some in town. And another cool thing about aspen is that they clone themselves. So they, they send down, um, like, un they send down underground stems, basically, and then they come up beside their parent tree. And so it, it's all the same tree. It's just connected underground with a lot of stems coming up that look like separate trees. So you end up with these little groves of aspen. And they kind of, they're really good at taking over um, um, areas of, 
disturbance and, and that sort of thing. So like on roadsides and stuff like that. And they have really nice leaves. They're called trembling aspen because they have these really round leaves that really shake in the wind. They're, another name for them is quaking aspen because they like shimmer in the wind. And yeah, so really round leaves, quite small. And they, they have a little bit of a point to them. And photo number six shows them having a little bit of toothed edge to them, but I would say that that usually the really round shape is the best way to ID an aspen leaf. And they're quite small, and so like it's that big. Um, and yeah, they look really nice when they're golden because they're kind of like little golden dollars on the tree. And they have catkins as well. So photo number four is of an aspen catkin. And then cottonwood. Um, cottonwood is definitely um, a deciduous tree that can be the, the obvious mature tree in a stand. Like it can, it can reach the, the canopy or grow above the canopy of the conifers around it. It gets really, really big and it's really good at occupying wet sites. So like um, river bottoms and along the lake and stuff, you get lots of nice big cottonwood that provide really good habitat for wildlife when they're alive and when they're dead. Um, I wouldn't say they have much of a shape to them. They also have multiple tops like other deciduous do. Um, they have really nice bark that gets these really long vertical lines in it. And it's usually pretty uniformly gray. But yeah, it gets really nice cracks that just go straight up and down the, the trunk. And it's usually pretty straight up. And then it might have multiple tops with a uh, coming out in one point. And the leaves get really, really large. So you get nice big leaves that kind of are also a teardrop shape, but they don't have any toothing to the edge of them. They're pretty smooth and they have a really waxy appearance. So in photo number four, you can see that they're a nice green leaf, but they're kind of shiny because they're kind of waxy on top and they're really tough leaves, like they're pretty hard. And photos number three and six are of the catkins. And so like in the late summer, we, if you get like that fluff floating around, that like white, some people call it poplar fluff, I think, but um, in our area, it's usually from the cottonwoods. So it's like little pieces of cotton with a seed attached to them. So they spread their seeds by the wind because these fluffs float around. Um, so yeah, that's all I had for you guys. We can talk about other species too, if you want, but I'll just go over some suggested resources first. So the ID book that I really like for plants is called Plants of Southern Interior British Columbia. It's by Roberta Parrish, Ray Coupe, and Dennis Lloyd. And um, I like it because it's for all plants or most plants in our area. It's really comprehensive and it has a good tree section with um, all the different ID features listed like bark, leaves, um, ecology, and then it has other notes in it about like Aboriginal uses, um, if it's edible, what other species look like it so that you can kind of sort out what you're looking at. So it's just a really good comprehensive guide. And like I said, it has other species too. So if you're interested in IDing like um, flowers or mosses or something, that's all in there as well. And the publisher, which is um, Partners, I think, or Lone Pine, um, they have other versions for other regions of BC as well. So like I have the, I have the Southern Interior one, which is really great. This cover looks different than the picture I put on there. I think that's of a newer edition. Um, and then I also have one for Coastal BC, which is super similar. And they're just, they just have different species in them, obviously, because BC is so diverse. Um, a good free version of an ID book is called Tree Book. It's been developed by the Ministry of Forests, actually, our BC ministry, um, learning to recognize trees at British Columbia also by Roberta Parrish and Sandra Thompson. There's an earlier edition from, I wanna say the 80s by Garth Coward. I have that one, I didn't bring it with me though. Um, so it's a pretty small book, and but it's free for download from the library section of the Ministry of Forest website. And they also have a lot of other useful tree information on their website. So I would say our ministry, um, Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, or just Ministry of Forest, they're super helpful and, have a lot of good um, resources. So if you just type in like tree ID book BC, a ministry link should come up where it might be like right to the PDF that you can download. You can either print it or like have it on your tablet or whatever. Um, and then eFlora BC is a really good website. 
that was developed by the University of British Columbia. And it uses, it kind of like shows plants in their geographic location. So it's just like a geographic based information system. So um, trees are covered under vascular plants and they have all these sections for different plant species. And so it'll show a map of where that tree grows and it has all the ID information and a lot of good photos and stuff. So that's a good website. Um, iNaturalist is a good app for people with smartphones or smart devices. It, it uses citizen science to um, ID anything, like it can be a bug, it can be a tree, it can be a plant or an animal. It'll ID, or yeah, so, so other people can ID your specimen for you. And so yeah, you take a picture on your device and then it attaches it to a map that people can see. So they see where you took your photo. And then um, you can, if you think you know what it is, you can say, I think it's a hemlock. And then other people will say, yeah, you're right, it's a hemlock. Or they'll say, no, you're wrong, it's a fir. And then once there's enough positive IDs or like people confirming an ID, then that data goes into a database that scientists can use to study different species. People can download the data and use it, which is super fun. I found that app really, um, it was really helpful when I was in Australia because when you don't know anything about the species anywhere, you can just take a picture and then automatically somebody IDs before you. So that's super cool. Not automatically, but over time. Um, and then just other university websites or forest service websites are also reliable resources. So like UBC, um, probably um, Okanagan College or something like that. Ministry of Forests from BC is really good. Washington State or Oregon State are quite similar to BC too. So you can use their resources and they're probably quite reliable. And But like I said, I would search by Latin name if you're looking stuff up online just to make sure you have the right species. So um, one thing I was gonna suggest to people before we go into questions is that you check out the Jackrabbit Interpretive Trail. It's out at the Wensley Cross Country Ski Trails up Upper Browse Road, just out of town. Um, it's, it was set up by NACFOR and they have um, signs on trees along the trail so that like you, if you walk up to a Douglas fir tree, there's a sign on it, not on every single tree, but like throughout the walk, there's I think seven or seven to 10 tree signs. So it's just a nice way to confirm an ID when you're on a nice hike. And yeah, there's a trail brochure available on the website. And we just cleaned the trail a couple weeks ago. So I know there's no blowdown or anything and it's in good, good walking condition right now. So yeah, questions? Great. Thanks, Erin. That was great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, uh, does anybody have any questions for Erin? If you do, just uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, otherwise, put them in the chat and I'll ask them for you. Okay, I have a question. Um, what time of year do the pollen cones appear on the lodgepole pine? The pollen cones, that's a good question. I would say that um, we could expect them pretty soon. Cause you know, like early summer, late spring, you get a lot of that orange pollen on your cars. That's usually tree pollen. So yeah, I would say coming up pretty soon, we could expect that. And would it be the same for the, um... Oh, I think it was the Engelman spruce. Yeah, I think probably most pollen um, would come out at the same time. Um, and uh, this isn't really fair, but I was interrupted and I uh, just if you could sort of review, you went through the in the deciduous, you went through the paper birch and the trembling aspen and the black cottonwood. Mm -hmm. Was there any in between the aspen and the cottonwood? No, I just went over those three. I couldn't really decide if I wanted to include some of the more shrubby deciduous that we have. Like I contemplated putting an alder or a maple, okay. um, something like that. But yeah, those are the three main, main tree-like species that we have in our area. The others kind of stay as shorter shrubs. Can I, can I maybe get you to ID a tree that I have on a picture on my phone? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Um, I don't know how well you can see it. And it's in winter, so I don't have leaves on it. I'll get as close yeah. as I can. Um, I would say that it looks like it, it could be a maple or something. Okay. Just because it has such smooth bark to it. it yeah. 
definitely easier when it has leaves, but yeah. This is where it's amongst some other ones. You can't really see it very well. I think the other one's easier to tell, but yeah. I'll, I'll wait until I've got leaves and the, whoops, and they're coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe something like that. Okay, thank or you. It could be, like if it's growing by um, a house or it's like a, a settlement or whatever, it could be a planted species too. Like it might not necessarily be a native species. It, it was planted, yeah. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Go to the chat and see if anybody's written questions in there. Yeah. I think mostly just thanks from folks. Yeah, that's great. Thank you guys. Yeah. I love nerding out over stuff, so hopefully I can do <laughs> another <laughs> another ID thing. I hope so too. I just wanted to mention um, that I'm not I'm not sure if people can see me or not. Uh, it, can you? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to let people know that we got all these great field guides uh, in at the library. I'm, I'm super excited. And so there's all kinds, animals, birds, weeds, the sky at night, which glows in the dark, by the way, um, trees and wildflowers. We also have binoculars that you can take out, hiking poles. So please uh, come by if you're in the cusp and check out some stuff. And yes, I hope uh, we will have Erin back do another ID mm -hmm. of some kind in the future. Yeah. Do you, yeah. do you think that if people wanted to find ID books, could the library get those in for them too? Absolutely. I was actually going to say we definitely have the um, plants uh, ID book of the Southern Interior here. So we definitely yes. have that and we have other books besides. And if you have any suggestions, please let me know anybody, including um, Aaron and everyone else. Um, if you've got some great books, we always want to know because we'd love to get them in. That'd be excellent. So yeah, um, thanks so much, Erin. This was really great. You made it yeah. really clear and easy. Um, okay. Yeah, and and um, I think everybody really enjoyed it today. So if you want to stay in touch about more upcoming ID uh, workshops, please just send an email to the contact at library.ca and we'll let you know. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.